John Zaker, producer of Kite on a String, the Bobby Kimball story. Welcome back to Australian Musician. Thank you for having me, Greg. Uh, John, I just wanted to catch up. Uh, we're six or seven months down the track since our last chat. Wanted to see where things are at. Um, let's start with Bobby, uh, who is uh, suffering from frontotemporal uh, dementia, a disease which progressively gets worse. How's he doing? Uh, is he residing at home with his wife? Yes, he's still residing at home with his wife. And, and uh, you know, there's still that that guy in there flashes of him every now and then of the funny things he says, but he doesn't understand it anymore. You know, the things that he, we're talking about a guy that had a pre-med degree and was very well studied before and would call you about books and movies and all that stuff. And now it's very, you know, minimal things. Or, you know, if he gets obsessed about his driver's license, he'll call you or he'll say, please take me to the DMV. I want my car. And that just wouldn't work because he yeah. would wipe out himself and everybody on the road. But uh, uh, it's advanced along pretty good. And, you know, this, I guess, this this frontal temporal dementia, I've studied it quite a bit. And it's kind of taken on a life of its own with the Bruce Willis and then the Wendy Williams. But that, I don't know if you saw that, that was kind of, it, it it went as quick as it came because it was kind of like a it was like a circus. I, I don't know if you saw all that stuff, the drinking and somebody's after her money and all this stuff. And I were I was getting text messages. I hope you don't portray Bobby. Never, never in a million years would I portray Bobby in any kind of light like that. You know, this is a very it's an unbelievable film where we're at right now. It's it, it's just heartwarming i guess and is the right word i, I don't know but uh it's nothing like that circus that's going on over there with that whole thing so so what's his awareness now of this project and have you showed any footage to him well he saw the trailer and he watches youtube old football games and he kind of thinks they're happening now yeah. like tcu and texas and you know, he'll have me come into his room with him and watch those games. And and I just kind of go along with it. You know, I've tried to tell him, you want to watch the one that's really happening today instead of the one from 10 years ago? He doesn't understand. And it just makes him happy. So you just let it go. Yeah. You know, from time to time, especially when I first started the film, that's the thing in the film. It, it all the main focal point is Bobby and I on the couch and I'm asking him questions about his life. It was going to be the record we cut in 96, but after st all the editing started, I just had that moment where I was like, it needs to be right here in his living room. You know, all this footage I got because it's so endearing. And, you know, you're asking him questions about the band and about where he grew up and this and that. And he was a little more, uh, he was still not all the way focused, but he was a little, you could understand it. So it, it it lend itself to the perfect vehicle to, you know, to tell this story. So things have changed a lot since then. And, you know, it's the simple things. It's the simple food. He used to love sushi. He can't eat that anymore. He, he'll, um, you know, kind of vomit in his mouth. It has to be simple things like chicken or, you know, I, I don't think it's peanut butter and jelly, but just basic things like that. Yeah. with him and uh you know they get that that disease frontal temporal dementia is basically what they call a pick protein a pick body protein it's a rogue protein that eats your brain so and it feeds off of sugar so he eats packs of sugar he, he'll try to take him wherever he goes so um he's advanced along quite a bit and really the doctors one doctor that i interviewed for the film said he's fascinated that he's kind of hung in there, you know, but um, his, his world is his house, basically. Uh, uh, last time we spoke, you were about to head to LA for the California Hall of Fame, uh, where Bobby was being inducted. I know Bobby couldn't be there and his wife, uh, Jasmine, 
accepted the award for him. Uh, how did that go for, uh, well, how did it go? And how did it go for you in the film? It was good. I mean, I just, I filmed, I filmed his part, um, you know, his induction. I, I had to put together a sizzle reel for them, you know, because they didn't have that kind of production going on. And I mean, I appreciate what they did. And it was another award for him and it made him happy. I don't know if you saw the picture when he's holding it up and I brought it to him, but it's like, with this complication, as soon as he got the reward and held it up to the photo and smiled, he was like, <clears throat> you know, so, but the, the, the award was cool. They, they inducted some cool people, but I think they need to, even they need to regroup a little bit because, you know, there was some talk, they were trying to get Steve Picaro to bring the Picaro brothers and the father, uh, that induction and Steve would lead it. But there was a lot of not organized situation there. And uh, it was a little, it was a little frantic, let's say that, but it, it was well worth it to give them that. They called us back and asked us if they could, they're doing it again next month and they wanted to put him in for a lifetime achievement award. And I said, I think one's enough right now yeah. uh, because it just seemed like it was like, I, it didn't mean as much anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So that all went very well. I filmed it and I, uh, Jasmine accepted. She did a great job. She's doing a great job taking care of him right now. And uh, so that was good. Uh, yeah. Um, I believe Steve, Steve Karras uh, from Toto Management has been very uh, helpful with this project. Helpful with me personally, you know, as we got to know each other. It wasn't always that way. You have to remember, we met each other under when Bobby and I were doing We're Not in Kansas anymore and it was being released on three labels, King Record, In Acoustic in Japan, Cleopatra in the state, States, I think they had me confused with somebody overseas that would play with Bobby that was causing some drama right. for a minute. And I got a call or I called to talk to them because the, somebody had sent an email from Toto Management to Susumu Marikawa at King Records, the head of A&R there, and said, if we see the name Toto anywhere, we're going to sue. And that was kind of one of the reasons we called it. We're not in Kansas anymore. He's not in Toto anymore, you know, and other reasons. But it was he when we had that conversation, he opened up with started yelling at me. And I was like, OK, are you finished? And then he calmed right down. And then I was like, I'm I, you guys have me confused with somebody else. I'm stateside. I, I've been with Bobby for a long time. I did another record with him. We had a conversation then, and then when I started doing this, I reached out to him and talked to him, and he's helped me through the way, all the way, like setting up the interview with Luke. Uh, what do you need next? After I was leaving Luke at Thurs, you know, he's like, Steve is very happy with you. Luke is very happy. You did a great job, blah, blah, blah. What else? And I said, well, I need David before I leave. And he called and he goes, tomorrow or whatever it was. It was like a day later at 1230. Uh, he checks on me. I run stuff by him. And I think that's the other thing they appreciate. You know, they're so used to and probably most big, you know, entities like Toto is they're used to people running over them or trying to get something by them. I, I try. M mine wasn't like that. I wanted to be wide open and pick up the debris that was out there and make sure that they understood that we were I was doing everything above board. I mean, maybe to even where I didn't have to, but they're going to review the final rough cut when the second, third week of May, it'll be in their hands, my agent's hand, uh, the distributor's hand and Sony's hands. Everybody will review it. I've even said to them, if you have some questions about areas or you're not comfortable with something, let's talk about it. I just wanted to be wide open with them. And I think that's what they've enjoyed that there is no hidden pie in the face for me. I'm not here to, you know, make anybody look bad or try to do an aha moment you know what i mean yeah. um you've been so close to this project for so long uh have there been people involved uh that have viewed what you've done along the way to give you give you uh some fresh eyes have okay and uh, repeat the question has there been somebody else looking at what i'm doing yeah yeah have you been bouncing uh ideas off anyone oh yeah or, or is it oh, yeah, just totally all in your head? Well, 
You know, I, I think I've spun this about four different ways since I started. I had an idea and I took off and I and when I started, it was just like, OK, forget all the ideas right now. Just go get the footage and then let's start molding like a clay a pottery situation. You know, I kind of knew where I was going. But like I was telling you before we started the interview, you know, I was going to anchor this all on a record with this video footage I had from 1996 from San Francisco. But it turned out it was better from Bobby and I on the couch and me asking him questions about his life because there's more of a storyboard there and it gets to go out to everybody. It stays in that center and then it just keeps going out and coming back. So, yes, I've been bouncing uh, at first, maybe too much with some friends and other people. And then you slowly realize, mm, I bet other people, directors and producers that are doing films don't do this because everybody views movies a different way. You know, when you go to a film or whatever, you come out and this person likes that uh, scene and this one likes that scene. And these people like Scorsese and these people like Quentin Tarantino and these you know, it's all over the map. So you get all these, well, you know, I would have him walk over. So that was maddening because okay. you have this vision. And then I raced away with about 25 minutes, the opening scene, I, this fantastic, fantastic uh, drone footage uh, and uh, a Toto song and some scenes. And I was just like, I played it for Bobby's manager, Lucille. I played it for Bobby's sister because we're pretty close. And when I was down in bed shooting something else, I needed a train sequence. I needed, and the tears were flowing out of her eyes and Lucille was crying and then happy. And then, you know, a couple people like that, but not as many anymore. I will, when I finish the rough cut before it goes to them, I have a setting up like a 20 person focus that I, people I don't know here in Dallas. And I want to have a private little, and I want to hear what they have to say. And then, you know, while it's going out to Toto Management and the guys and the distributor and my agent and Sony. Uh, Sony really doesn't matter. They're just going to see the cue sheet, the amount of music I use, and give me the totality of everything then. But, I mean, Greg, this, it's a huge undertaking as one person. I, I probably had no clue how much energy it was going to take how much time especially you know where you, where i'm sitting right now with you here is my is my laptop and this screen this is adobe i'll put the roughs together of several scenes then i'll take it over here to pro tools and then i have a keyboard down here and i'll start i'll start scoring the music and i'll throw a toto song or one of bobby and uh, my songs in there or one of Bobby's solo originals and I'll move it around and then I'll come back. Then when I have a good chunk done, it goes over to the editor. We've kind of done larger chunks now so that it's not so well, you know, tedious of you need to clean these photos, the transitions and stuff like that. So I didn't have a clue and I did, I don't know if I'm thick skinned enough to take some of the pot shots with fans, you know, they know it all. They know what time Steve eats his lunch. They know what time Bobby would drink his water. They know what, I mean, they know it all. And you, and I respect them. They're great fans, but there's some of them. There's a little pocket of them that throw some arrows. Somebody did it to me the other day for the Kickstarter and called me a scammer. And this, it was very, and I take that personal because I've been so transparent, probably overly accessible to people. You know, here's my email. They message me. I video. I'll call them and talk to these people. I want everybody happy. And sometimes you just can't do that. Yeah. So um, you mentioned Kickstarter. There's a final Kickstarter push. Um, how can Australian Toto fans help? Well, that Kickstarter is up for, I think, 24 more days, I think is today. So by the time you guys see it, it'll probably be 23 days or whatever. It's already 23 probably where you're at. Uh, if they want to donate, there's some, uh, there is a couple people from Australia that actually donated for the last one. This one, let me explain that real quick so they understand. So there was a small loan, a business loan I took out and there's my credit cards 
And I've been pretty creative to, you know, I didn't take in any investors and that might have been something else I probably should have done from the beginning, taking a partnership on. But it was almost like some people came forward. I didn't ask and, and they wanted to do this tax credit and run money through this and that. It was just all too overwhelming for me. I just want to be a simpleton. So I started switching balances for 0% of credit cards. I have multiple credit cards. And then uh, a loan got called in that was supposed to be paid back this summer. And it just put me in a position where it's like, all right, all right, right. I, I, I need to run just another small Kickstarter because there's like almost $15,000 in credit card debt. There's a $10,000 loan I have to pay back. There's other bills out there. I got to go to LA. There's, you know, taxes coming up, which I have to pay on these two Kickstarters eventually. So uh, if they want to help, they can go to Kite on a String on Kickstarter. The final push, it's called. Uh, the other one is closed out anyway. There's some great rewards in there. There's hooded sweatshirts. There's T-shirts. There's movie posters. Um, and yes, I fulfill all those rewards myself. I truck back and forth to the post office <laughs> and handle the customs papers and all that. It takes me away from here. But these are things you have to do as an independent filmmaker to have any kind of success or help. And I think that in a Kickstarter realm, which is so much different than GoFundMe or anything else, is that they have film divisions in there, music divisions, tech companies. You know, they kind of have it all in that uh, situation. So it was a necessary thing and it keeps the project out in front. And plus beautiful people like you and other formats that interview me and keep it in the forefront. I appreciate it. Um, last time we spoke to you was during the writer's strike. Um, we were talking mm. about the discussions you were having with distribution. Uh, mm. Where are you at with distribution and uh, well, final cut? Right. So right after I talked to you, I was kind of, you know, you learning as you go along. It's kind of an ideal time. Somebody else I know had one of their films picked up then. But, you know, just as I thought, well, can I take the trailer to film festivals? No, you, you need to have the whole thing done and they need to pick what section they'll preview. So I met uh, with one distributor, well-known distributor while I was there after the California Music Hall of Fame. And they wanted me to sign a first right of refusal before my rough cut was in place. Well, I mean, I respect them and the amount of work they put out, but I was kind of short selling myself because, you know, you want to have this rough cut in place. Now, they'll probably assign an editor. In fact, it's 99 percent. They will. And they might say, well, this scene sucks and this one's good and this one's bad. Where's your bit reel folder? Let's grab other scenes. So but I wanted more. I wanted the whole rough together first before I signed any deal. So I declined to sign. And they were fine with it. Another company that was courting me, I said the same thing to them. I want to wait respectfully. I would like to wait until I have the final rough cut in place because I want them to see kind of where my vision was and then, you know, uh, judge me on that and put their worth of me on that as far as what they think this film is deserved. And there'll still be, like I said, there'll be more stuff to go. There'll be editing done. I <laughs> they're going to bring in somebody. I just, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with all that. And I wish I could have had like more of it edited at that point during the writer's strike. But this film, it, it holds its weight. It's really a beautiful deal. It's a great project. It has many different stories going on. You know, it's got this guy with frontal temporal dementia that had this unbelievable career. Then the band and the amount of work they did and that unbelievable catalog and the accolades that they've received. And then this kid that, or this guy that's, you know, has some compassion for his friend and wants to tell the story. You know, one of the, uh, one of my marketers, digital media marketers was over here a couple of weeks or a well, week and a half ago watching as I'm editing. And he said, you know what? I need to stop you. He goes, I want to know just as much about the guy that's asking him the questions and what he's going through too. He said, that's what's so great about this. There's like these kind of three tier things going on or four tier with his family. And uh, so that was nice to hear because sometimes you, 
wake up and you're doubting yourself. And I mean, there were a couple of days here where I just walked in my studio in circles and I'm like, okay, I need to put the brothers in here. I got to do a voiceover. You know, I have to write all this stuff. I wrote a part for another voiceover guy the other day that people will see in here and we nailed it, but it's, it's a lot of work, man. Like I said, <laughs> but it's going to be worth it. Yeah. It's going to be worth it. Well, John, Were we at the point where the guys saw the trailer last time? Did they already see it and I spoke of it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because the response from, I need to say that too, they've all been so nice to me. Steve Bacaro and I have a great relationship. We talk all the time, Lenny and I. Steve Lukather and I would text back and forth. He's one of the funniest guys on the planet, and he cares so much for Bobby. Joe's been great. David Page, unbelievable. One night I was just sitting here and it's like a text pops up while I'm working. And it says, it just said simply, bless you for enduring. Yeah. I mean, that feels good, you know? Yeah. I had to build that trust up. No, you know, a guy coming in to do this. I mean, some of them might have heard of me, but they didn't know me, you know? And now it feels good because that's all I ever really wanted, you know, as. Bobby said, I found an interview. He said, I I remember telling Bobby when we did that first record, all I ever really wanted was to do such a great record with him that he got back in Toto. Well, it probably wasn't because of the record I did with him, but he did get back in Toto. And I told him, you belong back in that band. He had another run with him. So I want to honor that, that amazing catalog of music and that body of work that these guys did. And all of them, I would like to make them you know, proud, Bobby's family, proud, everybody. I want them to have a good ending with this because this is it for him. You know, this is how people will remember him. I couldn't have them remembering him in this mysterious, you know, oh, he's got dementia and not seeing and understanding what he went through. And, you know, I, I think we touched on it before. Some people misunderstood him for that last, say, five years because he was... He didn't know anything was wrong and he would have some odd behaviors. So yeah. this will help clear some of that up as well. Well, John, it sounds like you're, you're almost there. Uh, keep plugging We're away. There. Keep your chin up. Thanks for We're everything there. you've done. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up again. Right. Thank you so much, Greg.